in 2006, um, I started another label with a friend of mine who was affiliated with Cooking Vinyl. Cooking Vinyl was like a, an indie label uh, run by a guy called Martin Goldschmidt. I worked with a guy who ran subsidiary labels for him, Mike Chadwick. And Mike's asking me, oh, let's start a label. You know, we distribute it through Cooking Vinyl. So at the time, it was apparent that Blood and Fire didn't have a lot of money. That's what I was, the, that was the words I was getting from my co-director, Bob Hardy. We haven't got the money. So I did a deal for like, a, I think a six albums came out, two, three Glenn Brown albums, an album from Ozzy Hibbert, Lego dub, the dub to the Gregory Isaacs LP that we put on Blood and Fire. That should have come out on Blood and Fire, but like I say, we never had the money, apparently. But the one I really liked the most was this. This is really a Blood and Fire album. Carlton Patterson. You know, and there's 21 tracks there. Wicked Tubbies. Mixed, all mixed at Tubbies by Tubby, by Jamie. I think there might even be a couple of scientists on there, but most of them need some classic. I mean, Watergate Rock is the dub that made Tubby's name. Yes, Psalms of Dub. You know, you even had a label, and the title on the label was Drum and Bass. That was it, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, King at the Controls. A lot of the intros were done by Joseph Cotton because he was an intro man at Tubby's. So that one with, uh, for example, the Mikey Dread, where you get um, somebody saying, dash it away now, Dread, dash it away. That's Joseph Cotton when he was known in Jamaica as Joe Walt. I mean, that was all part of the Blood and Fire thing. But when Blood and Fire went down, like I said, I did Colton Patterson and six others for a uh, Hot Pot label, which was a label because it was for cooking vinyl. We, I called the label Hot Pot. All those things, that's another Hot Pot label. This only came out like that. It's it's ten cuts of um, Mr. Harry, Dirty Harry. Ten killer versions of one of the greatest rhythms ever. And Chris Glenn Brown, he stayed with us a couple of times. One time he was there for four months, you know, driving my wife nuts, using all her cooking pots, because he used to be Peter Tush's cook in America. I really loved Glenn Brown. He had his he had his ways, but very creative guy. He taught my oldest son, showed him some things on the guitar, you know. Um, you know, and he was like um, almost part of the family in a way. Until until uh, he got to a point. I mean, <laughs> I got him some, an advance for uh, some some hot pot LPs and um, he decided he was going to go and stay with Errol Dunkley but he went and spent 500 quid on lottery tickets and he won 350 quid back <laughs> yeah that was Glenn he'd do things like that but another man who, who died everything wrong with him physically mm. but I'm I'm really happy what can I say? I've only got great memories of Glenn Brown. Um, he looked after me in New York when I went over with Bunny Lee, um, stayed with Clive Chin, and Glenn took me up to Living Room Studios one night uh, when they had those Crown Heights riots. You know, there's plenty of police everywhere. Glenn was the type of guy. We were driving along in this old car, and he saw some police with a black youth, you know? And he just stopped the car in the middle of the road, you know, went out to have a look. And I'm sitting there. The riots are in full swing. I'm this white guy sitting in a car 
in Brooklyn, you know, I'm thinking, what the, you know. I met a lot of great people with Blood and Fire. But when it went down, uh, ceased trading, I felt, well, I kind of done what I wanted to do, you know, which was to package and promote the music in a way that worked for the people who made the music as well as us. I mean, we we got hit with two distributor bankruptcies at the end. One in America, $100,000. You know, the company's incorporated in Delaware. So you get like five cents on the dollar. You know, you're screwed by the big guys again. In fact, that was the same bankruptcy that took down Rass Records. He lost more than us. Then our French distributor went bankrupt. 30,000 euros gone there. And they're big blows, you know, to to a two, three-man operation, which what Blood and Fire was. It was me, Bob Harding, and Dominic, Dom Soju. We uh, did 50-odd albums. Everyone got paid, except Big Joe. Never could find Big Joe, you know, so he had one track on the first album, DJ Was Your Trade. So just it said he, he, he had to run away because he, he killed a man. But whether that's true or not, I don't know. You know, but we never found Big Joe. So if Big Joe happens to see this, I'm sorry, but the company's gone. Um, you know, and you would get, he would have got the 16th of 19,000 sales royalty at um, 16%. Uh, you get half of that, 8%, because Sonny Lee, as the producer, would get the other half. Uh, and he would get 8% of wholesale. Probably not a lot of money. But um, it's something. A lot of people never got anything from these other companies. People have asked me to do stuff. Like um, Noel Hawks and myself went out to Germany a few years back, 2014. And um, we met uh, Richard at Bear Family. Who, he, he was a guy who said he was a label who did country and western, Schlager Records, German pop music. And um, he did uh, Rockabilly and Rhythm and Blues. And he said, uh, all my customers are dying now. You know, we need some new customers. So he wanted us to do some reggae for him. We did a couple. Um, there was an attempt to do a kind of repeat of Darker Than Blue that I did. But this company didn't really have the distribution, you know. They did a nice package, you know. Yeah. Again, what I like about those, the pictures on the front show black people because black people made the music. Okay, I'm a white guy putting it out, but I know who made it, and it wasn't white people. <laughs> That's a fact. So we got to show that. Did another one which I really love, the cover. Sly and Robbie, Taxi Gang, Disco Mix. You know, and what it is, is uh, Sly and Robbie doing soul versions. Yeah. I love the photo. Walking on the North Coast somewhere. And there they are, the dynamic duo. There's Robbie, bless him. I like Lobby. Another guy gone. But, yeah, that's, that's life. And that's my, my own label. Put that out. Mm -hmm. uh, life is from uh, Dudley, Dudley Swavey, Jarman. Uh, General Echo album. Not a slack one. More roots and culture and dance all. guy called Ski Williams did the cover. Uh, hand-drawn, hand-lettering. Uh, I lost about 
five or six thousand pound on that. Oh. <laughs> because the company I put it out with, they didn't have the distribution. You've got to take care. You've got to have good distribution. And um, these big distributors, very few of them understand the reggae market. And now there's no shops anyway. So, you know, all the shops, a lot of the shops are gone. Uh, now you you can make a vinyl and you've got to put it out for 30 pounds, you know, to get your money back. Uh, so it becomes a kind of luxury item. It's not what I like to do. You know, I'm not serving the luxury goods market. I'm serving the people who like music and who appreciate culture. Another one there, Dennis Brown. We agreed to do this with Dennis. Great photo by Beth Lesser. Um, but he died. So, in the end, again, through Bunny Lee, I hooked up with Dennis's widow, Yvonne, and she licensed that to us. Okay. Uh, again, it's, you know, Dennis Brown was the singer with Gregory and Johnny Clark of the 70s, you know. People talk about Bob Marley, fantastic. Um, great. Uh, I find that I rarely play those Bob Marley LPs, you know. This is another one. I've got to tell you about this one. This one was Manzi again, Dudley Swaby, 129 Beach Street, which was his address. We made the road sign and we put it up on a wall in Whitechapel, East London. What it's meant to show is that that street, Beach Street, it went down. It's gone. It's not like it was in the 60s and 70s. Uh -huh. So this is a sort of uh, what you might call an elegant picture. You know, it's saluting the music street, the shop where the street where Prince Buster had his shop, Bunny Lee had his shop, Leslie Kahn, Beverly's had their shop, Pablo had his shop up the top there. But um, that was a stencil. In fact, I, st I intro made a stencil for me, and I put it on my record box. You know sprayed it on, you know. So that was it. We did, I mean, there's the other, the Glenn Brown dub album, you know. Um, Glenn. This is Robbie and Dirty Harry. And there's Glenn, studio photo. That's his passport photo. Um, <laughs> and that is the end of an orange box that became the frame. You know, like those those wooden boxes that they package uh, oranges in? Right. And they've got wooden ends and slats on the side and that. And that became the frame to frame Glen Brown, sprayed on another stencil, Glen Brown and King Tubby. Termination dub on there. <laughs> Never been released before, Glen. Glenn used to walk around with a box of tapes. I kept badgering him to, what's those tapes, Glenn? It's, you know, he says, oh, they're all dats, different mixes. He used to take his stuff to Tubbs and say, Tubbs, mix me four or five styles of any particular rhythm. And I found that car dirty, Harry. It was first issued as Determination Skank. So I called it Determination Dub. I called it Termination Dub, you know, mm. uh, because it's, you know, the last uh, Harry Cut. Yeah, so that's how it went, really. Zeb, you know, that's some of the background behind Blood and Fire and the sound system. And, uh, well, it wasn't the sound system. It was, you know, it was sessions that we that we did all over the world. We did America, we did one in Moscow, 
we stayed in a place where the guy had an owl flying around in the hall of the place where we stayed. That was me, Dom, and a, a young, well, a younger, an English singer called Spikey T. Spikey T used to sing on the mic, and he could DJ, he could beat mitts, he could rap, and he could, you know, he's an extremely good, talented guy. He went to Australia, but um, I think he's back in Jamaica now. Really talented guy. And, you know, he was the front man for the sound because I'm not going to get up there and chant lyrics, you know what I mean? Especially with this accent, you know. <laughs> um, I believe the front people are Jamaican or Jamaican origin. In fact, Spikey was born in Jamaica but came to England when he was about two years old. So uh, I've always, for me, it's always been a Jamaican thing. You know, that's why I respect a label like Fashion in South London. These John and, and Chris, they grew up with the music in England. And when they come to record it, they don't do no two-tone or digi-dub. You know, what they do is Jamaican singers or Jamaican origin singers who are expatriate or living in the UK. And they recalled, you know, uh, Lover's Rock, kind of mo uh, modernised rock steady, dub stuff. They use what they had to hand. You know, Chris Lane played bass and guitar on a lot of those records. He played in Maxi Priest's band, you know, for a time, the first hand he had. Um, <clears throat> so those guys, I respect them. And they gave me... Well, certainly John McGillivray gave me a lot of advice when I first went to Jamaica. So in some ways, he was like a mentor. But my main mentor was Bunny Lee, Dennis Al Capone. They were the two people who told me a lot of stuff, you know, uh, how to handle myself. You know, because when you go to Jamaica, most European people, they won't have seen how people have to live in those ex-colonial countries. You know, um, that's the legacy of British colonialism in Jamaica, you know. Um, and it's not that impressive, believe me, because people were essentially abandoned. Yeah, they got a democracy, a social democracy, Tweedledum and Tweedledee. You got your JLP and your PNP. But because they're an ex-colonial country, they are dominated by the major metropolitan countries, in their case, America, USA. Um, so, you know, and you can't build a decent system on bauxite when it's owned by a Canadian company. So the only thing, really, that Jamaica's got, apart from tourism, which, let's face it, Tourism in, in those type of countries is essentially holidays in other people's misery, you know, the local people's misery. I mean, I worked in the tourist industry in the 60s in Spain and saw really how it ruined Spain, you know, big skyscraper hotels. What, what has Jamaica got that is produced by Jamaicans for Jamaicans? Music. And that music's gone on to go global, you know, remix, that's dub, rap, that's DJing. Okay, I know it started in America, but Cool Hurt came from a Jamaican background. You know, um, I'm not saying that it directly led to it, but Jamaicans were the first people to really exploit the idea that you could reuse a rhythm track with six different DJs and two singers. You know, all on the same rhythm. Um, and you could mix up those rhythms differently for every sound system that would come to Tubby's studio. Tubbs could, like, as Glenn Brown said, Tubbs, give me five different styles on that rhythm. You know, and Tubbs would do that. So would Jammy, so would Scientist, so would uh, Professor. 
you know, and not only at club, is at Channel One with Maxi, Maximilian, Peter Chemist, all those people. Yeah, it's in, that's an intensely creative system of dealing with music. You know, yes, you've heard it, but I'm going to give it to you a different style. That's what those engineers did. And uh, that means that you felt good because you've got something that the other sounds haven't got, even though it's the same drum and bass pattern and chords and whatnot. You've got your own mix. To escape the mass and be somebody, you need to set yourself apart. You can do it as a sportsman. You can do it as a bad man. But the best way to do it is as somebody who runs a sound system and a little record label. That's just for me, you know. That's what I think. And I think, well, two million people, you know, ten different studios, a lot more now in the digital age. All that music comes out of there. And um, like I say, it went global. So give thanks. That I certainly do. And I'm happy that I had the opportunity to uh, deal with it in some way. And I can still sleep at night. <laughs> That's it, Zeb. <laughs>